South Africa ranked 141 of about 180 countries in the world in terms of women's representation in Parliament 20 years ago, 141. As of this year, 20 years later, it ranks number three. So my first question to Jane uh, is, how do you account for this change? Understanding that membership in Parliament or participation or representation in Parliament is not the sine qua non of women's leadership, but it's a marker nonetheless. So let's start with that question. And Jane has told me I, she could be talking about this for hours. My job is to get an answer from her and then ask a different question. The obvious answer to the fact that post-1994, post what we call in some circles flag democracy, post-colonialism, why do we call it flag democracy? Because as Alison says, the transition in 1994 was not only not a complete transition. It was, in fact, not a transition in some substantial ways that I can comment on later. Those ways have to do with the processes of economic infrastructure that have not changed within that particular territory and, in fact, have deepened um, poverty in the year 2014 is, in fact, if measured by the genie, deeper than it was in 1994. For many, leadership meant a commitment to radically different values. Those values had been incarnated in some of the liberation movement struggles, and they were struggles in the trade union struggles, in the liberation armies incarnation, where there were substantive discourses on the meaning of gender, as well as on the meaning of defeating the apartheid state. A couple of years before 1994, there was a very, very interesting collective called the National Women's Coalition that sought ideas cross-country for what, what do you want to see in the Constitution? What do you, is it education? Is it access to jobs? Is it the prevention of violence? What is it? They drew up a charter. And it did have an impact on the negotiation, as did the fact that the dominating party, the African National Congress, was willing to put in place a 30% quota on the party lists of anybody who was to be elected at local level, at national level, provincial level, 30% of those people had to self-categorize as women. Jane, interrupting. The ANC makes this quota real. Yes. The other political parties follow suit. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. And that had effects later on. The other thing that I want to put in place here because this is what happened in other countries in, on the continent, post-flag democracy. One of the first things that happened through what gets called development discourses is that all transitions, most transitions from colonial rule on the continent were accompanied by deep interest by the World Bank and the IMF and the North in general in the economic future of that country. This meant in many cases the importation of ideas about women and men. That in fact, even though I would argue that in South Africa, the initial investment in having women as parliamentarians had indigenous roots that were located both in the liberation struggle in many ways and in the trade union movement. South Africa, of course, also became vulnerable to discourses in which ideas about gender balance were being driven as much by IMF 
development policies as they were by movements on the ground. The women who got elected to parliament were predominantly the women who had held um, important, influential coalition building positions within the liberation struggle. Some of them came directly out of Mkwonto with Sizwe. Tell people what Mkwonto and Sizwe was. Mkwonto and Sizwe was one of the liberation armies that took on the responsibility post 1960s, early 1960s, of adding a relationship of armed conflict to the other sources of resistance that were already being mobilized, both within the country and throughout the world. I mean, it's very important to understand that the apartheid regime fell through a concerted and long-term effort on the part of many different bodies and organizations. In retrospect, the ANC, um, of which I, up until very recently, remained a member, has explained the fall of the apartheid regime as simply an engagement with the ANC's Liberation Army and the ANC's political resistance. This is simply not the case. It is the case that, that the winners tell the retrospective story. We all know that. But Omkonto um, Sizwe was, was one of the Liberation Armies. The long story of the past 20 years, which is the years of your lives, mostly, in the room, include by now a, a level of disappointment in what the current state of democracy looks like under the ANC rule, a state in which elitism and a complete irresponsibility to what I would call the facts of the case what are the dynamics of your own experience of, of let's call it non-racial, which is the ANC ideology? What are the dynamics for you as a white woman in a society in which now, more than ever, uh, whites are, are not necessarily expected to take leadership? If you take intersectional analysis seriously, you will realize that standpoint, positionality, questions of ethics, questions of strategy depend on being able to think through the way you are powerful and the ways in which you are not.